Welcome, everybody, to This Week in Legal Blogging, presented by LexBlog.com, in which we talk with leading bloggers from across the legal industry. I am Bob Ambrogi, and uh, I write the blog, Law Sites, and also have the podcast, Law Next. And our guest today is Tanya Forscheidt. Tanya, how are you? I am great. Thank you for having me. Uh, great to have you. Well, you know, I, I was just going to introduce you, but why don't I just let you introduce yourself? <laughs> sure, no problem. Um, so I am the chair of the privacy and the data security, privacy and data security practice at a firm called Frankfurt Kernet Klein and Sells. Um, I am based in Los Angeles. Um, this is not Los Angeles, uh, but this was promoted with palm trees, and I thought I'm going to go all in. Um, so uh, I am based in Los Angeles. The firm is a, a, a boutique, mid-sized boutique firm that's been around for more than 40 years uh, in New York. And they added an LA office about f uh, five years ago. I joined the firm about four years ago and we've grown the privacy and data uh, security practice since then. And uh, that's what I do day in and day out, privacy data security. And, and not only do you do that, but you're, you're considered one of the leading data privacy and security lawyers in the world. So, and, and you write, uh, you contribute now to uh, the, the blog Focus on the Data, which uh, offers unique insights and practical guidance on privacy and data security issues worldwide. Um, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about your blogging. But I just, because, uh, because we are in such crazy times, I always just like to ask people, how are you doing and how, how are you holding up during these crazy times? Doing good. You know, actually, I, I'm going to tie this into blogging somehow. Um, I think um, <laughs> I like that. That's good. <laughs> I think that having had a practice um, like the one that I have, where historically we have often worked with clients all over the world and written about developments all over the world because privacy and data security work is by definition global in many ways and data flows everywhere all over the place. Um, I, I am a little more used to what it means to be sitting wherever um, in front of a computer or on a phone and writing um, or communicating electronically from wherever I am with people everywhere. And I've been doing that, you know, for, you know, really 20 years. And so while this is new and uh, more mandatory, because we don't have the freedom that we used to, to be somewhere else, um, you know, communicating with the outside world through blogging and otherwise has helped, I think, a lot and helps to um, remind people that we're all here uh, and still connected. So, um, you know, we're getting by. <laughs> yeah. What about uh, from your client's perspective? I mean, have the issues that they're coming to you about during this pandemic, do they look different? Have they changed? Well, yeah. I mean, in some ways, very dramatically, because uh, COVID itself has raised privacy issues that we didn't uh, really have to deal with um, before, including in the private sector. So the client base that I work with is corporate um, of all sizes. Um, and in all industries, right? It's a very uh, multi-industry practice. It's not industry specific. And so, for example, as organizations are starting to think about, and in some cases already have started to bring people back to offices in jurisdictions where that's possible, there are all kinds of questions about what can you collect from employees as far as health-related information, as far as um, temperature reading, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so what's happened that's really different um, is now my group is collaborating much more closely than we were before with our employment lawyers in New York and Los Angeles to advise. Now, we always have employment privacy questions, but these are much more um, pressing um, and immediate and acute yeah. and time sensitive. So that's been a big change. And just general questions about contact tracing, right? Um, so technology companies are developing contact tracing apps and a lot of privacy questions have arisen around what, how that should be done in a way that is um, fair to consumers, transparent to consumers, and isn't going to result in the long-term in harm to consumers um, from misuse of that information, for example. Yeah, it's, you got to be really walking. A, a, employers really must be walking a, a, a tight wire there in sort of the balance between respecting privacy and respecting 
you know, the, the well-being of, of their workforces. It must be yeah. a very difficult. It really is. And um, needless to say, public health, you know, when we balance interests, public health weighs very heavily, um, even when up against privacy, which is a very considerable interest. But depending where you are in the world, um, it's very cultural. So in Europe, for example, privacy is a fundamental human right. In some states, like California, we have a constitutional right to privacy. Other states don't. And in the U.S., historically, things like innovation and you know, capitalism have often uh, outweighed privacy concerns. But when it comes to public health, we actually have a public interest, an in interest of individuals in their life, in their actual livelihood, that in many cases may be more significant than their privacy. That doesn't mean we can throw privacy out the window because we've learned the lessons from example, uh, for, um, from, for example, 9-11, uh, when privacy interests were subordinated to national security interests, and that uh, led us to all kinds of places that we're now still dealing with. <laughs> so we don't want that to happen again. Um, that it is very difficult balance. Right, and and you're a, a privacy lawyer, and you're in California, so I am yes. assuming a lot of your time is CCPA. Is that CCPA right. a lot? Um, and uh, and as many people know, that's still evolving because that law just really just took effect um, in January and uh, the, the attorney general started um, enforcing in July and the regulations didn't get published until August 14th. And today is September, what, 17th? And, um, and November 3rd, I think it is, we have an election with a ballot measure here in California of the California Privacy uh, Rights Act, C the CPRA, which is Prop 24, which may replace uh, the CCPA effective in 2023 and totally change the landscape again. So it is constantly moving. So Tanya, the, the blog that you uh, currently write for, as I said, is uh, Focus on the Data. And that blog, I think, started in 2016, from, from yep. what I can uh, figure out. Uh, but what I learned all of about two minutes before we started this this program is that you had you were blogging uh, well before that. So how did you get started, and, and what was your first blog? Yeah, I I, I do want to kind of talk about the history of my blogging because um, so focus on the data is is my a, my current firm's uh, blog that we launched when I joined the firm in 2016. And I have a wonderful group. I just wanna, before I go back to the history, I wanna give a shout out to the people in my group who write for this blog. Some of them have moved on to other things, but the ones who are still with me, Daniel Goldberg, Amy Lawrence, um, Elliot Siebers, and Shelly Berry in particular, and there are others. Um, Jeremy Goldman gets a special shout out too. Um, they are amazing. 16 bylines on your blog over, over the course of its lifetime. So yes, we've had a lot of people. It's a wonderful, wonderful group um, who have written on all kinds of things. Um, historically, so the way I got to know Lexblog was back in, I want to say 2006, <clears throat> which is crazy um, long time ago now. Um, I thought I should do a blog, like I should do a blog, that's a thing. And it was new and law firms were just starting to dip their toes in it. Yeah. And I must where, have where were an, you then? What were you doing? I was at a firm, uh, a large firm called Proskauer, very well known firm, uh, <laughs> New York firm, also in LA. I've always been in LA. I have this p pattern of being in big New York firms, uh, based in Los Angeles myself. And, um, we had privacy practice group. Um, and we had actually done a treatise uh, on privacy, which was awesome, um, and worked with a guy named Chris Wolf, who I also want to give a lot of credit to for being an amazing mentor in this space and who had worked on or developed this treatise, Proskauer on Privacy. And so I thought, let's do a blog um, to build on that and to have current content that we're updating all the time. At the time, it was really new. And it was something that a big, you know, AmLaw 100 law firm, which, which Proskauer was, was, was not just going to jump into you know, without thinking about it, but, but they let me lead the charge and we got it up and running. It was, um, March, 2007. I worked with Kevin at Lexblog because I had read about the company that he was working with law firms. And I thought, well, if I'm a lawyer and I'm going to do a blog, I should probably work with a company that is specifically doing law blogs. 
Um, and uh, and it was great. And now I think what was that uh, blog that, called? That was the Proc Era on Privacy okay, blog, right. um, which made sense. Uh, the Privacy Proc Era Privacy blog still around. Um, they do great work there. And um, and I will say now I believe Proc Era. I'm not, I don't want to misstate it because I haven't double checked. I think they have dozens of blogs now. They have dozens of them. So it it worked out really well. Um, what it did was a, for me at the time, it effectively allowed me to get my voice as a member of that practice world, which was still newish, not new, but like not mainstream. Law, lawyers didn't really understand what privacy was. It was like, is that a legal practice? And, um, and then I started to do speaking and other things, and it, it helped to develop um, a profile for me in the community of people who are doing this. And so that was the first one. And then from there, and this, can I, can also, I just stop yeah, at, uh, real yeah. quick and just ask you, <laughs> where, where were you at, in your career at that point? I yeah. mean, had yeah. you, how did you even get into doing privacy law? Was that something you set out to do? Were you, were you doing it from the outset? No, it's not doing it from the outset. At that point, I was already, oh goodness, I'm going to age myself. So I, I graduated <laughs> Law school in 1997. You, so you can't the, age yourself. Well, be you can't age yourself beyond me. So uh, don't worry about it. I don't know. Uh, I I had graduated law school in 1997, and I was a litigator. There was no such thing, really. As a, it's certainly not in California, not in Los Angeles, as a as a privacy lawyer. And I never uh, intended to do that. I was a general commercial litigator because in those days you didn't really specialize, um, at least not where I was. And, uh, and so for whatever, six, seven, eight years, that's what I was doing. And then this uh, gentleman I mentioned, Chris Wolf, who was a partner in the DC office at Proskauer was starting a privacy practice. We wrote this book and I, I, you know, I had worked with Chris and, and we had litigated together and he said, Hey, do you want to be involved in this? I said, sure. So I helped write the book and then clients were starting to have data breaches that required notification under the new, at the time, California data breach notification law, which was enacted in 2003. So it's in the aftermath of that. And, and so there were clients who needed help. And I started doing work, real work, not just writing the book. I was very interested in it. And I saw it as an opportunity to develop a real niche in my practice yeah. and not just be a general commercial litigator. And so I kept going with it and I was doing both. I was doing privacy and I was litigating and that was a lot, um, but we did it uh, and it grew and I became sort of the West Coast point person for it. So it, for me, I was a senior associate and then eventually got promoted to partner, I think in like 2007, actually at the same year I started the blog. So that might not have been a coincidence. I don't know, uh, but it really did allow me to develop a practice and a reputation that I, I hadn't had before at that very important stage. Um, and, and I did, think, and did I the will blog okay. contribute to that in any way. Did the blog contribute oh, to, be yeah. able to develop that practice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause like, you know, people would find the stuff and read it and, and reach out. Um, I remember once we had the blog, there were clients, existing clients of the firm, you know, maybe in other practice areas. And they'd be like, hey, you know, I saw that you wrote this blog. And if you're going to be in New York, we should get together and have lunch or something and talk about what we're doing in privacy in our organization and like how you might be able to help us. So absolutely. Right. Um, and then you get calls from the press about things that you write and like, right. you know, the same kind of stuff that happens today. Right. Um, but but I would be remiss if I didn't mentioned one really significant thing that happened, which was a huge turning point for me, which was in around uh, 2009. So I had been a partner for a couple of years and I was really wanting to do nothing but privacy and data security because I loved it so much. And I was able to leverage the reputation I developed through the blogging to actually start my own law firm. So I left the big firm. I joined up with another uh, lawyer who was a big blogger, I want to point out, a guy named uh, Dave Nevetta, who's now at the Cooley firm, but who back then had his own practice in a firm called um, InfoSec Compliance and had been blogging. And that's how we knew each other. We knew each other because we were bloggers, right? We were both bloggers in the space. And we started a law firm called InfoLaw Group in 2009 that then grew 
And all we did was privacy data security. And that was, and since then, so since 2009, that's all I've ever done. Um, and we already had a brand because of the blogging. And we did some blog posts back then at Info Law Group, which was also a Lex blog, blog that we started. We did, we did some blog posts that still to this day are considered really important, like about cloud computing, which was a new thing that a lot of lawyers weren't thinking about at the time, right? Now it seems like antiquated, but um, it was really amazing. And it was a way for us to develop a firm that still, by the way, again, exists. It's got a, you know, a different group of people now who are wonderful lawyers and they still blog a lot too. Um, but that was really what blogging gave me was this ability to create a brand and create, um, again, a practice area that no one else, no one else was doing. And now, of course, it's the hottest thing in the world, privacy, data security, but right. it wasn't. Right. So. right. And it even gave you the introduction to the person that you started the firm. That, with. That's right. And, uh, and then we, you know, blogging was a huge part of our business plan. And, um, and then we, you know, we grew it and we brought in other people who are also amazing bloggers. Um, so, and many of those people have moved on to other places, et cetera, but they, I think they all still blog to some extent and use that um, to share their substantive expertise. Now, I wanted to go back to something you were, you mentioned uh, a few moments ago, because I was having this very conversation this morning with somebody who is a uh, professor at a law school. And we, you were, you were talking about you were doing the treatise, and then you, the blog kind of grew out of the treatise. Uh, and we were actually talking about that very topic because um, blog. We we're talking about the idea of blogs becoming um, archives in a sense, becoming almost like treatises over time as they build up this body of information in them, and then you can go back and look at them, and and how in many ways they've replace the treatise as a, as a, as a way of going, diving into a subject, privacy law, you know, privacy and data privacy law, being able to go back and look at the totality of what you've written uh, over time uh, and, and research that and, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, get that bigger picture of, of how the law has changed and evolved. I totally agree. Um, and I, I don't know who the professor was you were talking to, but I want, again, another good example and somebody who I know has uh, worked, talked to Lex blog a lot as well as a professor, Eric Goldman at Santa Clara. Right. Um, he has this amazing blog, which he's had forever, which is incredible. One of the best, the technology and marketing uh, blog blog. And it is just like that, right? You use that blog, you use Eric's blog um, to find all that stuff from like any sort of given point in time. So, you know, as an example, um, he has an amazing collection of posts, some that he's done and some that others have done as on that blog about um, like the enforceability of online uh, contracts, right? In terms of the use, uh, and click wrap, browse wrap, all the other nonsense. And whenever I'm needing to revisit that issue for whatever reason, I will go to that blog to, to just, you know, remind myself of the cases that have come before, see if there's anything new that they've been writing about, because if anybody's been writing about it, they will have been writing about it. And yeah, it's, it's because the world has changed, like I'm much more likely to find the new thing or the more sort of cutting edge thing or timely, even just timely, meaning like at the time it was happening, here's what somebody was saying about it, as opposed to the treatise where it's not necessarily bad resource. It's a good resource, but it's kind of stuck at a point in time. And then when you update it, it's a whole process that's much more involved and time consuming. And I do think it's too bad in a lot of ways that that's, you know, the treatises can't, haven't evolved quite the same way, but blogs are an amazing resource. Now there is a downside. I don't want to mention, say this without mentioning the downside with blogs because there's a blog like Professor Goldman's blog, and then there's lots of other blogs out there. And a lot of other blogs, a lot of blogs, period, have bad, bad, bad information on them. And a lot of legal blogs have bad information and incorrect legal analysis on them, right? And it's not legal advice, obviously, everybody knows that. It's so important to not just take at face value what you see on a blog. You still, if I'm talking to an associate, I'm gonna say, you still have to do your backup and make sure that you're looking at the primary sources, the statutes, the cases, whatever. 
Yeah. It, you know, I, I've been uh, on the internet long enough. I remember the early days of the internet. That's what the big public legal publishers used to say is you can't trust stuff on the internet. You need to get it from West or Lexus because you don't know who these people are who are out there writing on the internet. But but you do really. I mean, if, if you yeah. read a blog and, and you know, it, it doesn't take long to figure out if this person knows what they're talking about or not. Absolutely. And, and so I, 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 I will say what I just said about blogs is also true for treatises, meaning yeah. I, I never want somebody like if I'm going to tell a client, client says the statute does not require dot, dot, dot. I am never going to say that's right. The statute does not require that you do X, Y, Z. If all I've done is look at a blog or if all I've done is look at a treatise, I'm going to follow up and look at the statute. I'm going to look at the annotations, the case law, make sure maybe even the legislative history make sure there's nothing else. So it's not the definitive end, you know, be all ends all, but neither is a treatise. It's equally true. The internet, treatises are not more reliable than the internet. The internet is just a different medium, right? right. It's just paper versus electronic, but neither can like hold themselves up as truth. No. Right. So uh, when you came to your current firm, yeah. you started another blog. I did. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it, what, yeah. Was that a was that a conversation you had with the firm before you even joined them? I mean, we, not before I joined, but but I knew because I had gotten to know the firm well enough that that was something they were going to be open to. And in fact, not only were they open to it, and you know, obviously we got that going very quickly when I joined. The firm has now actually added itself, even though it's not like a huge firm. They have other blogs now too, quite a few. And one, the one in particular I want to highlight is the Frankfurt Kernet advertising uh, blog, um, advertising law blog that is out there um, that people can find. And it is um, amazing. They have so much stuff and so much content in there. And then we also have an IP and media blog. So the firm is all in on the blogging. And we also have some lawyers who do things like um, – you know, live uh, podcasting. And so we have people do all kinds of crazy stuff, which is great. And we do a lot of social media. I shouldn't say crazy stuff. It's, mm. it's really fun. It's really forward thinking. And we, and we leverage those tools. Um, so yes, the firm was very supportive of it and, uh, and they've been great. Yeah. So I, I, I see from your LinkedIn profile that you are a political science and English major as an under, undergrad. And, and that makes me wonder whether you were a writer already. I mean, did writing come naturally? Were you a writer before you started blogging? Not a legal yes. writer, but a real writer. Yeah, um, <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So, yes, that, that I, I have the, um, the classic, um, oh, yeah, this person's going to wind up being a lawyer because they can't be anything else. Uh, I was an English major, too, so I can, I, I can sympathize. <laughs> English and journalism. <laughs> yes. Well, there you go. So uh, political science and English. Yes. So I wrote. Um, so before I went to law school, I did. I did like to write. In fact, uh, even when I was a kid, I liked to write. I liked to write stories. And um, I did even think about journalism at one point when I was in college. Um, but I, one of the things that I have tried to bring to blogging, which is kind of comes from that background, is I like to make it my voice. Right. I don't like to just write sort of, oh, this court said that, da, 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 right. Um, I try to make it, you know, as as entertaining as I can without, you know, being annoying. I try to come up with titles that I think are catchy when I can. Um, I encourage the people who work with me and, and throughout the years who have worked with me on different blogs to do the same thing. And there are some blog posts that I still remember over the years that, that were just amazing in terms of um, how they were created and drafted. And when somebody is passionate about a subject, which I think is true for writing in general, like stuff just writes itself, as that's my experience. And that's true for blogs too. So people are oh, I do a blog, I gotta like write, it's gonna take all this time. If you are inspired by a subject, the thing will write itself. And it may take an hour or two you know, I mean, it shouldn't, hopefully with blogs, it doesn't take more than that if you're just doing a blog post. Because blog posts, I, I also don't think should be like crazy long, although occasionally it's nice to do something really meaty. But 
I will give you uh, an example from our current blog. So if people go to focus on the data, you'll find that my partner, Jeremy Goldman, who's a litigator, but who also uh, does a lot of children's privacy issues under COPPA and um, also data breach matters. He had seen an episode, um, this was about three years ago, of the Silicon Valley show, where they it was called um, Terms of Use, I think, actually the name of the show. Um, but it was about COPPA. It was about children's privacy law. It was actually, a, you know, this, this very entertaining show on HBO that addressed issues related to children's privacy. And it was hilarious. And Jeremy was inspired by having watched the show. And I'm pretty sure what happened is he watched the show and then uh, he was like, oh, I got to write this blog post. And he wrote it like overnight or something. He posted it the next day. And, um, and I teach a class at Loyola Law School um, here in LA. And I actually, we just did our class on the children's privacy stuff. And, and the blog post was one of the things I had them read. I mean, I had them read other things too, obviously, but um, you get inspired and you get, you know, you want to share with everyone like, hey, you know, here's some, I can bring this to life for you in a way that you wouldn't think is interesting, but here's this hilarious show about these guys who have these startups and they're always tripping over themselves. And they almost got, you know, in the show, they were, they were worried they're going to be fined billions of dollars for violating the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And, and that's like a real thing, right? right. Yeah. Um, anyway, it, so yes, writing can be really, you know, just wonderful. And, and blogging is a vehicle for taking, you know, what could be really boring legal knowledge and making it really interesting and compelling to people. Yeah. Have, have there been posts uh, that you've written uh, where you've been uh, surprised by the response from your audience or that have elicited a particularly strong or, or uh, unexpected response? You know, I um, as much as I try to be entertaining and speak in my own voice, I'm also very risk averse <laughs> in many ways. Uh, so, so I tend to avoid saying anything that's going to really drive people at the wall. But and of course, we're lawyers, so I have to say all the usual things about you run conflicts, you don't blog about things that can create problems with, you know, client conflict issues or like, you know, you have to be very careful that you're not just doling out legal advice and that, you know, somebody thinks you've formed an attorney-client relationship because that's not what's going on, right? All these things you have to be super careful about. Um, I would say the most, the, the most interesting kinds of responses that have happened have been where I've somehow touched on a subject that a lot of people are struggling with in their practice, um, you know, even if they're in-house at a company and they're just struggling with like certain kinds of contracts, right? Might seem like incredibly dull, but like I'm dealing with these contracts day in and day out. I, can't, I don't know what to do. And I've written something that's practical guidance, for example, on how to deal with certain kinds of contractual provisions in a way that hopefully is compelling. And I've had situations where I've seen someone at a conference afterwards and they've said, you know, I've got that thing like printed out, you know, because I go back to it like every time I'm doing one of these agreements because it's like my checklist or whatever. And that's a great reaction if you're a lawyer, because it's like, you know what, I've given someone a tool. I'm not giving everything away for free because it's not the end of the story as far as the legal advice that you might need in that situation. And they're not using it as a replacement for that, but they are using it as their first line of like, what do I need to be thinking about here? And they're going to remember that it was me who gave that advice. And so both from a just establishing that I'm a person who has that knowledge base and that you can look to me, you can look to my firm, whatever. And then obviously from a business development point of view, which law firms care very much about, you know, that's, that's a great way to give something to clients or prospective clients that they really appreciate and like really appreciate, like you made my life easier. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, th those have been really gratifying when they've happened. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, it's fascinating listening to you because it, your, your career tra tra trajectory is, is really kind of inextricably intertwined with blogging, right? Right from the earliest time. Where where do you think you would be today if you had never started blogging? I wouldn't have this practice. Um, that's for sure. Now, I I do say this with a little bit of guilt, and whenever I get contacted with <laughs> by by Lex Blog, I'm always like, oh no, because um, I don't blog as much as I used to. 
I don't have the time. But part of the reason why I don't have the time is because my practice has grown and been successful, right? So it's it's a bit of a double edged sword. But um, I do still try and I do and, and also obviously our group, we try to do things as much as we can, not as often as, as I'd like sometimes. Um, and certainly, for example, when we've been in like the throes of getting people ready for CCPA or in the middle of a pandemic or whatever it may be, it doesn't always happen as much as I'd like it to. Um, but I would for sure not be where I am um, in my legal career without it. And uh, and so I'm really grateful. You know, it was a moment in time. Um, I don't know if the same would be true today because there's so many blogs. In other words, I'm not saying people shouldn't blog. People should definitely blog. But I kind of stepped into it in a moment when it wasn't as as common and in a practice area that wasn't as popular. And so it was it was more compelling to people. I, I think I stood out a little more. And so the lesson from that, especially now that I'm older <laughs> and have hindsight, um, for the younger lawyers who might be watching, don't pass up an opportunity that might seem like, you know, a pain at the time to have to do because that particular opportunity may not ever come again in the same way because of the way things change, even just in the marketplace. So that that's what it was. Yeah, for sure. Okay. That's great advice. What what about those younger lawyers who might be considering starting a blog and maybe they're in a practice area where there's already an Eric Goldman or, or somebody uh, writing right. in that area? Do you have any advice for how whether they should blog and how they can make a name for yeah, themselves? For sure they should blog. Like I think anybody who wants to do it can find a way to have a unique voice, right? If you don't want to do it, then don't do it. Like you have to want to do it. Just like you have to want to be a lawyer if you're going to be a lawyer, because don't do it if you don't want to do it. But um, yes, you can find a way to make it unique. Um, what I would say is the, the thing not to do is to try to copy what everybody else in the space is doing, right? Because, and, and it's easy to avoid that because you all you have to do is, is um, you know, get on the, the news feeds from, you know, for the various groups through bar associations and otherwise who are putting out regular stories to see what everybody's writing about and how people are writing about it. What you want to do is find a subject and ideally something that you're already working on so that it's not something where you have to learn everything from scratch. Like you're already working on the subject area. You're not going to write something that's going to give away advice you're giving to people. You want to do that because you're not going to disclose the kind of advice you're doing, but it's a subject you already know something about, right? So, you know, in my area, um, if you work on data breach response, then you learn a lot of things coming out of data breach response that are just generally true because you see them from one breach to another, to another, to another, whether it's a particular kind of an exploit that you're seeing or um, a particular way of trying to remediate something, et cetera. You can take that bit of knowledge and you can create something that no one else has written. And I don't care if it isn't like the hottest topic of the second, right? It needs to be timely and it needs to be, interesting to people, but it doesn't have to be the hottest topic because everybody's going to be writing on the hottest topic, right? Um, but that's, I think that's the thing to do and to differentiate, differentiate, differentiate yourself. And, you know, the catchy title thing, catchy name thing, I know it's very superficial or could be seen as very superficial, but I really believe in it, right? If you can come up with a catchy title for a blog post, I mean, You'll get a ton of attention for it, even for people who will never read it. And that's terrible, but they should read it. Um, come up with a good title and you can really get a lot of attention to what you're doing. Yeah. Was there a point for you when you were blogging in your earlier days of blogging when you started to really become aware of the fact that this was working for you or, and how, how did that come about? I mean, so many people these days seem to be focused on like blog numbers and traffic and things like, especially larger firms yeah. get really obsessed with, with traffic, uh, which to me yeah. has nothing, nothing to do with whether a blog is successful or not. Right. Um, and, and so I'm wondering at one point, did you start to say, Oh, this, this is working for me. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think, um, there are a few things that, and it mostly started to come out, um, in the very beginning, 
but also, you know, once I started my own law firm, because once I started my own law firm, it was easier to sort of have have a visibility into the impact it was having, right? When you're a bigger organization, it's hard to know where all the moving pieces are, right? So if you're a really large law firm and you blog about something, and then a month later, suddenly there's a client who needs X, Y, Z, it can be much harder to connect the dots to know, oh yeah, that was because of this, right? Like it's harder to figure that out. But um, in my own law firm, there were things we could see, right? At that time, it was still kind of, interesting not you know now it's standard that you have analytics that can show you you know not not the person who's visiting your website but the company right and now these days we don't get quite as much of that because a lot of um people use anonymized ips and vpns it's a privacy issue but but um you know sometimes you can see that somebody from x company is looking at your blog post and you don't know who it is um and so sometimes you can tie together the fact that somebody from a company was reading something and then eventually contacted you about a, a matter. Um, also, I had situations where it wasn't through that that we saw the connection, but even more obviously through social media. So there's obviously the connection between the blogging and the social media and then what happens from that. So it's not just putting a blog up because it's like if a tree falls in the forest, right? Like you could write the most amazing blog in the world. Nobody will know about it. You got to push it out. You have to push it out through all those channels. Otherwise, no one's going to see it. Um, and you don't want to be super annoying pushing it out too many times. But if it goes out and then that's how general counsel would find us, right? In-house counsel would see through social media because they would follow certain feeds and stuff would get retweeted or whatever it is. And they'd see it. And that's how. They, and then sometimes we had people who came and said, oh, I saw this on social media. I want to retain you guys. Like, what happened? Right. Um, I have clients I still have today, years, years later, who uh, came in part through that. And and I always love to tell the story about, you know, a million years ago when certain lawyers who come from a different era would say things like nobody finds an, uh, nobody finds a lawyer on the Internet. Yeah. No. Not true, right? Um, but that's what people said. Um, so it was wrong. Uh, and people don't find a lawyer on the internet the way they, you know, they don't find a lawyer like by picking up a phone book and like flipping to lawyers. Right. They find a lawyer on the internet by doing research about who knows what, right. monitoring social media for expertise and seeing what other people say, you know, reputation, um, what others say. Influ influencers, right? That's what happens. Yeah, if you if you can demonstrate that you uh, know your stuff, uh, and a blog is a great way to do that, then people are going to find you and, and come to you. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask you real quick because a, yeah. a, top, a topic that I uh, write a lot about and speak a lot about and am passionate about is the uh, the duty of technology competence and how that's uh, evolved over the years. And I, I see that you have spoken and written about yep. that uh, from time to time. So uh, yep. what is what is your interest in that? And, and what, what, what don't lawyers understand about that? <laughs> oh, goodness. Lawyers don't understand so much, um, <laughs> myself, myself included. Uh, okay, so yes, technology competence has has been a big issue for many years for lawyers, but it's gotten even more significant during the pandemic, right? Because so many people are working from home and have to use technology in ways that they never um, did before. Many people, not everyone, but many people. So um, it, it, it kind of, there's a lot of different ways in which this manifests itself. At, at, in daily life for me. One of it is just a purely like um, lawyers who want, and I don't necessarily, I'm not really talking about lawyers within my firm, right? I'm talking about lawyers that I know through bar associations and um, people, you know, sole practitioners who are having to figure things out. Um, lawyers who have been practicing for 30, 40 years who are trying to adapt to using technology, right? The practical, how do I use things like Zoom and other kinds of video conferencing services and the cloud in a way that's not just effective to get my work done, but also isn't going to put client data at risk, 
Right. That's a privacy data security issue. Right. So, th so the attorney um, ethical issues overlap with the privacy data security issues. We actually, in my firm, we have a, a, a practice group in New York that is um, professional responsibility and ethics lawyers. That's what they do, right? So um, Ron Minkoff, Nicole Highlands, Tyler Malsby, John Harris, a bunch of people there. Their work is to advise on, you know, how can a lawyer find themselves in a situation, you know, avoiding sanctions right. and all that good, you know, disbarment and malpractice and all those awful things. And then my side of it is what can a lawyer do or fail to do with respect to client data and use of technology that can wind up putting them in a situation where they have to talk to those folks in New York. We don't want that to happen. So what one of, I'm going to use an example that um, is publicly available information, which is that since the pandemic hit, we have seen a lot of news reports about law firms getting hit with ransomware, for example, where, you know, somebody says that they've, they've locked up all your data. You can't get to it. Um, you have to pay them Bitcoin. Right. And that has an implication, not just for the lawyers, but for their clients, client confidential information. Um, is it a situation that's a data breach? Maybe, maybe not, because the data breach laws are with respect to personal information, which may be things like names and social security numbers. And there may be some of that in there, but the lawyer may have an ethical obligation to notify clients, even if it's not that kind of information, personal information, if it's client confidential information, and now we have bar um, state bars that have committees issuing opinions. Like here in California, we have COPRAC that issues opinions about attorney obligations and, and issued a, a, an interim opinion recently on data breach obligations. Um, so there are consequences. And, and if an attorney is hit with a ransomware attack, they can't just turn a blind eye and say either, oh, I'm just going to pay these people, get my data back, right? right? Maybe get it, maybe you don't, right? Yeah. By the way, the FBI's official position is they shouldn't pay. There are people right. who pay, whatever. Right. Um, but either way, you also have to think about whether those people might have the data, have acquired the data and used it or misused it or something in a way that's going to give rise to some sort of a notification obligation. And nobody wants to think about that. Lawyers have not been good about facing the reality of that. And now we also have, as you know, rules uh, and comments in the ABA rules that have now also been adopted in California about technology competence that say a lawyer needs to stay abreast of developments in technology in order to be competent. It doesn't mean they have to have deep knowledge, but they have to at least associate with people, whether those are other lawyers or technology professionals who can help them understand the technology well enough, right? Um, and this is not a little thing. I did a presentation for the, uh, I think for the LA County Bar, I can't remember anymore, um, a few months ago. And, you know, somebody put something in the chat in quite Q&A about like, oh, I can't just forward my email to my Gmail. And it's like, um, you know, right. Right. no, yeah. like, you know, <laughs> or, you know, my password is one, two, three, four, five, you know, now I'm making this up, but um, mm -hmm. people need to understand things like multi-factor authentication, encryption, all of those things, because that's, you can't just be a lawyer anymore. You have to understand at least at a basic level, how to protect electronic information. Yeah. I, I make it a habit when I, when I speak back in the days when I used to speak in, in front of audiences to ask how many lawyers in the audience know how to encrypt an email. And you will generally see maybe, you know, two or three percent of an audience that even knows how to do it. Um, right. right. So, and there are lots of let me just say for all the lawyers listening, to that, and everybody freaks out. Everybody goes, oh, my God, oh, my God, what do you mean? There are lots of cheap or almost free, in some cases, services that can help you to encrypt email, that can help you set up multi-factor. Um, and some of it's just human. Right. Remember, yeah. like some of it is just seriously don't open attachments. You don't know where they come from. Seriously hover over the email address when you get the email that looks like it comes from a regulator or from the CEO of your client to make sure it's really them. If it's like, oh, I wanted you to see this photo or I wanted you to see this document. Like, don't just click. Don't just open. Right. Don't don't hand over information to people you don't know, you know, behave in the same risk 
averse, you know, conscious way that you would if you were advising your clients on, you know, mysterious communications, right? That's that's what you have to remember. Yeah. Tanya, I've been asking you lots of questions, and, and I, I know you're sitting there on the beach and probably waiting for your pina colada to get served any moment, but uh, <laughs> what, what else, is there anything else that you'd like to say about blogging uh, that, that we haven't talked on, or advice or, or uh, experiences that you'd like to share? Yeah, um, well, you know, uh, I think that it's, um, blogging is kind of like anything that's, um, worth a little bit of effort that that's that seems very difficult to sort of like just take that first step to do and then once you do it so like the best com comparison i can give is you know working out right going to the gym or these days not going to the gym working out somewhere not at the gym right, right? um it's putting on the gym clothes and getting on the bike right that's once you do that then it's fine with blogging it's having the platform, picking up the pen and just starting to let that, you know, flow in the same way that any writer would. And if you're a lawyer, you're probably already somebody who likes to write probably or writes pretty well. And, and think of it as, wow, I don't have to write a legal brief, you know, in this particular format or whatever with these, with this very specific structure. I don't have to write a contract where I'm just cutting and pasting these particular provisions. I get to write something that comes from me, right? I get to write something that is like, you know, something I've been thinking about and really want to share. And, and if you look at it that way, it's a real opportunity and, and, um, and I would say something so hokey, but like a joyful thing to share your knowledge with people. Um, and so that's what I said, you know, just start and it is worthwhile and it will come back with very positive, um, results for you. So whenever my people, when I say my people, they're not my people, like the people I work with, my group, whenever people in my practice group blog about something, I try to push that out as far as I can and to give the credit to those people because, they're the ones who took the time to like go through the trouble. And now hopefully everyone in my, you know, social media sphere knows that this colleague of mine has a particular knowledge regarding this other thing and they get to get the credit and the feedback on that and the sort of satisfaction of getting to be known as a person who does that. But eventually you sort of have to do it for yourself too, right? You have, you can't just sort of rely on others to do it for you. So blogging is a, is, it's a great way to do that. And, um, you know, and again, I, I wanted, I still want to do even more of it myself um, than I do now. Uh, and this is going to reinvigorate me as well to get back to, uh, now everybody's going to be watching for the next thing I vlog about. <laughs> uh, but uh, hey, we're going to hold yeah. you to that. Exactly. Exactly. No, I, I just want to encourage everyone to get, once you get started, that's the key thing. Right. And to love it, to like make sure you're doing the things that make it fun for you and not just writing about things that you really don't like. Yeah. Well, I love that thought that it's 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 actually a joyful thing to share your knowledge and, and to put that down on paper and, and share it with people. And I, I, I totally agree with that thought. So, well, Tanya, it's been a real pleasure to speak with you and uh, yeah. really, really enjoyed uh, hearing your thoughts on blogging and your experience with blogging and, uh, and appreciate your taking time out of a busy schedule to do all that. Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to be here and uh, appreciate you all giving me a few minutes to talk. So we've been speaking with Tanya Forscheid of the blog Focus on the Data and of many blogs before that. Uh, and uh, she is chair of the Privacy and Data Security Group at Frankfurt Kernet Klein and Seltz in Los Angeles. Uh, you've been uh, listening to and watching This Week in Legal Blogging. You can find all of our past episodes of this series at youtube.com slash lexblog. On behalf of lexblog, this is Bob Ambrogi. Thanks for watching and listening. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. <laughs>